Welcome to the CCNA Cisco NetAcad Switching, Routing and Wireless Essentials Lecture Series. If you are interested in the previous lecture series, which is the introduction to networks, I will leave a link in the description for that playlist. If you are a networking student, I would recommend that you watch the introduction to networks lecture videos before you diving into this course. Today, we will be covering module number one, which is the basic device configuration. In this lecture, we will learn how we can configure devices using security best practices. We will cover the topics of configuring a switch with initial settings. We will learn about how we can configure switch ports. We will learn about sec how we can secure remote access. We will also cover some basic router configuration and verify directly connected networks. Configure a switch with initial settings. So let's look at the switch boot uh, sequence for a Cisco device. After a Cisco switch is powered on, it goes through the following five step boot sequence. Step one, the switch loads a power on self test or post, just like a PC computer. And that post is run based on a program stored in the ROM. The post checks the CPU subsystem. It tests the CPU, DRAM, and portion of the flash device that makes up the flash file system. Step two, the switch loads the bootloader software. The bootloader is a small program stored in the ROM that is runs immediately after post successfully completes. So basically just like a Windows computer or general computer, when you power on a Cisco switch, it runs through the post and once the post is successful, it starts loading the bootloader software. And step three, the bootloader performs low level CPU initialization. It initializes the CPU registries, which control where physical memory is mapped, the quantity of memory and its speeds. In it, and in step four, the bootloader initializes the flash file system on the system board. And in step five, it finally boots, uh, you know, it's finally the bootloader locates the loads um, of um, default iOS operating system software image into the memory and gives control of the switch over to the iOS. So until the step five, what's happening is basically in the boot up processes is going through post and it is loading uh, the, uh, the bootloader software and then initializing the CPU. And then finally, if all the initialization is done, the bootloader initialize the flash file system on the system board, which allow it to run the default iOS operating system associated with that switch, which then take control over that switch. So these are the four, sorry, these are the five steps of uh, switch boot sequence for a Cisco switch. Um, this do show up on your quizzes, so make sure that you know uh, these four five steps. And I will cover this, this similar types of uh, initialization processes for Windows and other server systems in my hardware class that I will be posting onto my YouTube channel in the future. The boot system command. The switch attempts to automatically boot by using information in the boot environment variable. If this variable is not set, the switch attempts to load and, execu and execute the first executable file it can find. So the iOS operating system basically then initializes the interfaces using the Cisco iOS commands found in the startup config file. This startup config file is called config.txt and it is located in flash. So this is one of the unique thing about Cisco iOS, iOS uh, devices. The Cisco iOS operating system have all the configuration files 
uh, stored as text files, .txt files. These are basically text files that telling the Cisco device what needed to be loaded and what needed to be put into, into place when it uh, boots up. In the example, the boot environment variable is set using the boot system global configuration mode command. Notice that the iOS is located in the distinct folder and the folder path is specified and the use of the command show boot to see the current iOS uh, boot file, uh, what is it set to. So if you want to know on your Cisco iOS or device, so, so iOS device, I mean, uh, the, you know, you can use the show boot command to see what is set to. So in this Cisco switch uh, S1, uh, the boot system flash file is located in here and you, it shows that what file uh, is being used for the boot up, right? So the boot system in, in here is the main command and the flash it's right here, right after the these two dots, shows the storage device. And then this file name right here is the path to the file system. So it's not actually not a file name, it's the path to the file system. And then finally the file name is the dot bin file. Uh, even though it is a dot bin file is the dot I uh, sorry the ISO file name. Remember the configurations are still uh, saved in the Cisco ISO devices as text files and the configurations by default are saved under config.txt. That's where the startup config file is located. And they're basically the text command. So everything you enter and configured in your Cisco device, in, in this case, a Cisco switch, will be saved as a text um, data. So that is an important concept uh, when you are using Cisco devices, switches, routers, etc. Uh, all your configurations are actually saved as just simply text files, which then be used, uh, then being used uh, by your Cisco switch or router to load up those programs. I would say not programs, uh, load up those configurations when you boot up your switch or um, you know router. So let's look at the switch LED indicators. So on your Cisco device, you will have these indicators, SYST, RPS, STAT, Duplex, Speed, and PoE. The SYST or system LED shows whether the system is receiving power and functioning properly. So if there is an error with your power supply unit or there is a problem with your power, either this indicator not gonna let or it's gonna have a, a different indicator. So I will go through what these indicators mean, what different colors mean uh, on my next slide. So we will just go through what these indicators are in this slide. So the next one is the redundant power supply or RPS. That shows the status of your redundant power supply for your Cisco switch. Please remember that some of the Cisco switches may not have redundant power supply. In that case, this LED and this indicator may not be present on your switch. So this will only shows up if you have a Cisco switch, switch or a device that has that redundant power supply built into it. The next one is the port status LED or STAT. Uh, when it is green, it indicates the port uh, status mode is selected, which is the default. Uh, port st status can be understood by the light associated with each port. So if you look at your Cisco switch, each switch will have a LED lights on it and depending on the color of those lights and how it is blinking, you can understand how that lights work. And as we go through this course and as you are learning these Cisco modules, you will get to know uh, more about these uh, LED statuses. The next one is the duplex, which is the port duplex LED. Uh, when green, it indicates the port duplex mode is selected. Uh, the port um, duplex can be understood by the LED associated with that each port, as I mentioned before. The port speed LED or speed LED. When it is green, it indicates the port speed mode is selected. Port speed can then be understood again uh, through the light associated with each port. The port over Ethernet LED, sorry, the power, 
the power over ethernet led or poe present if the switch supports the poe again just like the redundancy power supply rpes if the switch is not supporting the poe this poe indicator will not be present on your cisco switch but if your device is supporting poe you should have this indicator on your uh, physical uh, switch and that indicates the poe status of the ports on the switch so whether the, it's actually uh, enabled or disabled the mode button is used to move between different modes such as stat uh, duplex speed and poe so by pressing the mode button you can switch between these different modes and in this slide we're going to look at those led indicators in a little bit in depth for your exams and quizzes for this particular lecture series and this particular course you should be able to identify these things based on the indicators so for example rps if there is uh, no indicator uh, that means uh, it is off if it is green that is in ready if it is blinking green that means rps uh, is up but not available amber indicates that is in standby but is in fault mode or it could be in fault mode or standby mode either or uh, and blinking amber is an internal ps fail uh, which is an uh, RPS uh, providing uh, power, but it, there is internal PS failure. Uh, and then there is no uh, alternating uh, green amber. So if so, you can go through this list in this slide and understand what each one of these means. Uh, I'm not going to cover every single one of them because you can pause this video and just look over this thing. Um, what you need to remember in this slide, what is really important, not only that you understand what each light mean, each indicator color of this light mean, but also not all of these colors are all uh, indicators are available. Like for example, for duplex, we only have off, which is half duplex and on, which is green, which show full duplex. And there are no blinking green or amber or anything like that. So that's what you need to understand. And the other concept you need to understand is that poe may not be supported or the you know redundancy power supplies may not be supported in all of the cisco switches and devices you have especially older models and in that case you will not have that rps and poe indicators available on your switch so that's all you need to understand the ba basic concept that you need to understand from this slide you can pause this slide and go over uh, each one of them and make sure you know what um, you know these indicators mean for your exams recovering from a system crash the bootloader provides access to the switch if the operating system cannot be used because of missing or damaged file systems the bootloader has a command line that provides access to the flash files in the memory the bootloader can be accessed through a console connection uh, following these five steps. So the, in the step one, in a case of a crash, uh, what you need to do is connect a PC by console cable to the switch port. Configure terminal emulation software to connect to the switch. Then in step two, what we do is we unplug the uh, switch power cord. Step three, Reconnect the power cord to the switch and within 15 seconds, press and hold down the mode button while the system LED is still flashing green. So that's an important thing. You unplug the power cord while uh, you have connected to the PC uh, to the uh, switch We're using a console cable. Then when you uh, bring back the power to the, uh, the, uh, the, your Cisco switch, you need to hold, press and hold down the mode button while the system LED is still flashing green. Then the continue to press the mode button until the system LED turns briefly amber and then solid green, then release the mode button. The bootloader switch prompts appear in the terminal emulator software on the PC. The bootloader command line supports commands to format the flash file system, reinstall the operating system software, and recover a lost or forgotten password. 
For example, the dir command can be used to view a list of files within specified directory. And remember, Cisco iOS and Cisco devices are pretty much based on the Linux and Unix operating systems. Uh, so the dir command, you may be familiar with your other classes that you are taking with respect to your uh, Linux and Ubuntu uh, servers. Uh, because that's the command that, you, you know, for example, in here, they're giving you that you can access to weave the files within a specified directory within the, uh, the Cisco ISO devices. And as I mentioned, you know, because Cisco ISO is based on Linux and Unix, you know, the similar command patterns uh, ap applies here as well. Switch management access. To prepare a switch for remote management access, the switch must be configured with an IP address and a subnet mask. To manage the switch from a remote network, the switch must be configured with a default gateway. This is very similar to configuring the IP address information on host devices. So if the management port is not open and if it is not properly configured with the default gateway and IP addresses, you won't be able to uh, do a remote access to a Cisco switch. In this figure on the right hand side, the switch virtual interface, which is SV1, sorry, SVI, on switch one should be assigned an IP address. The SVI is a virtual interface, not on a physical port on the switch. A console cable is used to connect to a PC so that the switch can be initially configured. So what that means is basically, when you get a brand new Cisco switch and you power it on, the SVI is not configured. The switch virtual interface is not configured with the IP addresses and the default gateway. So you need to use a, a console cable with your PC a, a computer and connect between the switch and that computer and use that computer to configure uh, the SVI uh, with by assigning the default gateway and IP addresses. Then you will be able to access the remote uh, management system. Switch SVI configuration example. So by default, the switch is configured to have its management control through VLAN 1. All ports are assigned to VLAN 1 by default. For security purposes, it is considered a best practice to use a VLAN other than VLAN 1 for management VLAN. So whenever I configure a Cisco switch or even a Cisco router, I typically don't use VLAN 1 for management. I use something like VLAN 99 uh, or VLAN something random. So in here, the step one, what we need to do is to configure the management interface. From VLAN interface, configuration mode, an IPv4 address and subnet mask is applied to the management SVI of the switch, right? So then note the SVI for VLAN 99 will not appear as up up until the VLAN 99 is created and there is a device connected to a switch port associated with that VLAN 99. And also note the switch may need to be configured for IPv6. Uh, for example, before you can configure IPv6 addressing on Cisco uh, Catalyst uh, 2960 running iOS version 15, you will need to enter the global configuration command SDM prefer dual IPv4 and IPv6 default and then reload uh, command in the switch. I know if you go through this slide, it will be really confusing to you. So what I'm gonna do, uh, I will do demonstrations of uh, all of these and post it to my YouTube channel and I will leave a link in the description and I might put a card at the top right hand corner with these kind of configurations, uh, demonstrations, videos uh, on my YouTube channel so that you will understand what exactly talking about here. What you need to understand for now is that by default, all Cisco switches and routers have VLAN 1 as the management VLAN, but it is recommended to change that management VLAN to something else. And I typically use VLAN 99, and in this example, they are also giving you the VLAN 99 configuration. 
And you also need to remember that the SVI need to be configured with an IP address and a default gateway. Otherwise, you won't be able to do the remote management access for a Cisco switch or a router by default. So in this slide, we are basically covering everything I discussed in the previous slide, except it shows the commands that you will be using in your lab to configure the SVI. So again, I will go through them uh, uh, on a video, like a demonstration video, where I will show you how you can do this. But for now, just remember, when you first boot up a Cisco switch, you will go into the global configuration mode. You can do this through either typing configure terminal or the short form config T and press enter. And then we will go into the interface configuration mode. In this case, we are configuring the interface VLAN 99. So what we're going to do is either we're going to go INT VLAN 99 or interface VLAN 99 and press enter. So this is by telling the, by entering interface, we are going into the interface by giving VLAN 99 in front of it by entering VLAN 99 here what it tells the device uh, Cisco device is we are entering the configuration mode of VLAN interface VLAN 99 and after you enter this we're going to press enter and that will get you into config if you know right here so that means we are currently in the configuration mode of that VLAN 99 and then we can assign the IP address by uh, using the Cisco command IP address and you enter the IP address with space and the subnet mask associated with it. And if you are configuring IPv6 addresses, what we're going to do, we're going to enter IPv6 address or IPv6 ADDR or you can do that in here as well with the short form. And then we give you the IPv6 address and with the associated information in this case slash uh, 64. And to make sure that the VLAN 99 is enabled, what we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do no shut or no shutdown. This command will put this um, interface VLAN 99 from being shut down back into online. And then by entering end, you exit out of it. And to make sure that your configuration is saved to the Cisco switch or router, what we do, uh, we're gonna make sure we're gonna run uh, the copy running config and startup config and press enter. That command will make sure that whatever you entered here, which is the running uh, currently in the running configuration, will be state saved onto the startup configuration. If you do not do this step, what's gonna happen is if you power down your switch and power back up, you will lose everything that you have done up here. So you need to make sure you always uh, do the copy running config and startup config. Again, I will go through this on my lab demonstration, but for now, just remember these are the steps that you need to take to configure the SVI uh, um, command, SVI configuration. So the next step, what we're gonna do in here is to configure the default gateway. Uh, to, for this, the switch should be configured with a default gateway if it will be available uh, outside your network. In other words, that if it can be managed remotely from networks that are not directly connected to that switch or router. Uh, please note, because it will receive its default gateway information from a router advertisement or RA message, the switch does not require a default gateway for IPv6 but it does require a default gateway for IPv4. So remember that that's a key uh, thing that you should remember for your exams. Uh, so Cisco devices or any uh, Cisco device that you're gonna be configuring this SVI, you need to go through this step two of uh, you know configuring a default gateway for IPv4, but you do not need to do that for your IPv6 because it will be receiving that the uh, that uh, the default gateway information through RA, the route advertisement in the IPv6, right? So if you don't remember how IPv6 works and how RA messages works, uh, make sure you go back and watch my videos from my previous lecture series, which I have covered the RA messages and IPv6 uh, routing protocol, right? So in here, what we do is just configure the default gateway for the IPv4. To do that, you basically go back into the uh, configure terminal or config T 
and we go IP default gateway and assign that default gateway IP address. In this case, it's 172.17.99.1, but you can put whatever the default gateway associated with your network. And then you end, uh, you enter the end command to exit out of the privilege exec executive mode. And you can uh, enter the copy running config and startup config. So copy running config, startup config will make sure that uh, this run configuration uh, information that you have just configured will be saved to the startup. So if the switch power down, when power back up, it will have this information saved in its ROM. You can actually run this command inside the configuration mode uh, by just entering do at the front. So instead of entering end here, you have the ability to enter just do copy running config, startup config that will also do the same uh, action uh if you want to do that without exiting here again i will go through them on a live demo and post it to my youtube channel so you have better idea than just reading off this slide and the step three which is the most important part whenever you configure anything on a cisco router or switch is to verify your configuration in here we have configured the svi uh, for the switch so what we're going to do is the use the show IP interface brief and show IP v6 interface brief uh, commands to check whether the both the physical and virtual interfaces are up and running. The output shown in here right here in this slide uh, confirms that the VLAN 99 has been configured with an IP v6 as well as an IP v4 uh, addresses. Uh, an IPv, uh, sorry, uh, an IP address applied to the uh, SVI is only for remote management access to the switch and it, this does not allow uh, the switch to route layer 3 packets. So this is just for the remote management. So that, that's also an important concept you should remember. So in here, in this example that Cisco provided to us, uh, they enter show IP interface brief and that shows the VLAN 99 interface associated IP address for that. And it is showing as uh, up on both uh, the protocol as well as uh, uh, the, you know, the status showing is down right now because nobody's connected to it. Uh, so if you, are, if you are wondering why the status is showing or status is showing as down, but the protocol as up, that because of this, uh, VLAN 99 interface is ready to go and it is up but however because nothing has been connected yet the status is showing us down so if as soon as somebody connect to this VLAN 99 because the protocol uh, call and everything uh, uh, gonna be up once it is up it, sh it, it these two this should be going back on onto the you know up mode so that it will connected and connecting uh, you know sending information back and forth in show IPv6 interface, it also shows uh, the the VLAN 99 as down on both of both sides, but the status and protocol, and it shows some ad, uh, information about uh, the the IPv6 configuration with that IP address associated IP address. So, in here in this slide, what you need to remember for your exams and uh, you know practical labs is the show IP interface brief command and show IP v6 interface uh, uh, show IP v6 interface brief command. Those are the two commands that you should remember in terms of verification of uh, SVI configuration we just did. So there is a lab called Basic Switch Configuration. Uh, I will find that lab and post it to my uh, website as well as leave a link in the video's description so you can go ahead and check that out if you do not have access to Cisco NetAcad uh, materials. But if you do have Cis access to the Cisco NetAcad material or you do have access to the your school's uh, lab material, please go ahead and download the basic switch configuration lab and do it because it'll cover everything we just went over. Configure switch ports. So let's look at the duplex communication. Full duplex communication increases bandwidth efficiency by allowing both ends of a connection to transmit and receive data simultaneously. This is also known as bi-directional communication and it requires 
uh, micro segmentation. So what is important here is that you need to understand full duplex mode, whenever it is possible, I, in my opinion, you should enable it uh, on all your Cisco and other networking devices because it increases the bandwidth efficiency and it allows uh, the bi-directional communication and that is good for speed and efficiency of your network. A micro-segmented LAN is created when a switch port has only one device connected and is operating in full duplex mode. There is no collision domain associated with a switch port operating in full duplex mode. Unlike full duplex communication, in half duplex communication, there it is operating in unidirectional uh, uh, mode in, in a unidirectional way. So the half duplex is unidirectional, and the full duplex is bidirectional. So therefore, half duplex communication creates performance issues because data can only flow in one direction at a time, often resulting collisions. So. Gigabyte Ethernet, which is 10 uh, GB uh, NEX, which network interface card, require full duplex connections to operate. In full duplex mode, sorry, in full duplex mode, the collision detection circuit on the network interface card is disabled. Full duplex offers 100% efficiency in both directions, transmitting and receiving, and this result in a doubling of potential use of the status, uh, sorry, uh, uh, stated bandwidth. So if you have a specific bandwidth, it's gonna use that uh, entire bandwidth to communicate with the full duplex mode. This is one of the questions that show up on your Cisco CCNA as well as CCNP exams. Uh, if you have a gigabit ethernet switch uh, or a, a device on your system uh, and that network card under full duplex will have the collision detection circuit disabled. A lot of students I have seen, a lot of my friends as well as you know people who have taken these exams forget that in full duplex mode, the collision detection circuit on the network interface card of 10 gigabyte NICs will be disabled. So that's some of the things that, you know, key things that you should remember because inherently in our brain, we automatically think that, you know, full duplex mode should have collision detection enabled, but no, it's actually disabled uh, when you have full uh, duplex mode. And what is important here is that, you know, the whenever, as I mentioned in the beginning, you have the ability to turn on full duplex mode on all your networking devices within your network. You should turn that on, but you shouldn't be using half duplex. Configure switch ports at the physical layer. Switch ports can be manually configured with specific duplex and speed settings. The respective interface configuration commands are duplex and speed. So in your Cisco IOS devices, such as switches and routers, you can enter the duplex and speed commands to configure the specific duplex modes as well as the speed settings. The default settings for both duplex and speed for switch ports on Cisco Catalux 2960 and 3560 switches is auto. In other words, it's set to automatic. The hundred, uh, sorry, the ten hundred uh, thousand ports operate in either half or full duplex mode when they are set to ten or hundred megabyte per second and operates only in full duplex mode when it is set to hundred megabyte per second or one gigabyte per second. So, the speed uh, when you have a port ten hundred uh, thousand ports, uh, they are either on half duplex or full duplex mode. Uh, when it is set between 10 or 100, if it is set to 10 or 100, but if it is set to 1000, which is one gigabyte per second, as we learn, it will be always set to full duplex mode. Auto negotiation is useful when the speed and duplex settings of the device connecting to the port are unknown or may change. So if you have a port on your uh, Cisco router or switch, and you're not sure what device is gonna be connected on the other end of that port. 
So at the end of that line that you are connecting to, you can use the auto negotiation uh, feature. So that is a very useful feature when we have no idea what will be connected on the other end. When connecting to known devices such as servers, dedicated workstations or network devices, a best practice is to manually set the speed and duplex settings. So if you are uh, connecting a port to a server that would be a, that, that line that you know for sure the server going to be duplex for example i would recommend that setting the port to duplex so that is not using auto negotiation in this case it will be using a set configuration to connect to that and also the speed so if you know the device going to have only 100 megabyte per second set a full, uh, you know full duplex at 100 megabyte per second and that will make sure that the server and your switch is communicating properly every single time and there is no overhead uh, associated with it because it is doing auto negotiation every single time it disconnect or connect so when troubleshooting switch port issues it is important that the duplex and speed settings are checked and mismatch settings for duplex mode and speed of the switch port can cause connectivity issues uh, auto negotiation uh, failure creates also a mismatch, mismatch of settings. Uh, also, remember all fiber optic ports, such as uh, Thousand Base uh, SX uh, ports, operate only at one percent speed and are always full duplex. So every single fiber optic port uh, should be in uh, Thousand Base XC ports uh, or similar to those ports, and they are always will be operating in full duplex. So not all uh, or fiber optic ports going to be 1000 base SE, SX, but you know, most of them are. So that's an example. And they are, because they are fiber optics, they're always going to be full duplex. Uh, an example of a very useful uh, time where you know, useful situation where you really need to use auto negotiation is that you have a office where you bring it bring your own device to the office so your uh, workers are bringing in their home laptops and connecting to your network you probably need to make sure you have to make sure that auto negotiation feature in your cisco switches and routers are enabled because you don't know what that device uh, is using for their network interface card and the auto negotiation feature can negotiate both the uh, full duplex um, uh, and half duplex as well as the speeds Another thing I should also highlight here is one of the most common issues with corporate and small business and business networks is that misconfiguration of duplex and half duplex uh, within the network causing uh, efficiency losses as well as uh, speed losses within the networks. So this is one of the very common things that you will find. So if you're troubleshooting a, your corporate network or your small business network, uh, with speed issues the very first thing you should be checking is the duplex uh, half duplex full duplex uh, configurations because these are very common issues that i see in the field so um we got this is an example of a configuring speed and duplex using a uh, Cisco command, using a set of Cisco commands on a Cisco switch. So in here, we are configuring the switch one, which is this one. And how you do it is you go into the configuration terminal type by typing config T or configure T and press uh, enter. Then it'll get you to the configuration mode. And in this situation, we will be configuring the fast ethernet 01, which is this one. So to do that, we're going to do INT FE01, or we can enter the full command in here. For example, interface fast ethernet 01, and you press enter, and that will get you into the configuration mode of that uh, fast ethernet port. And by typing in duplex full, what's going to happen is it's going to put this port into full duplex mode. And the, we're going to configure here the speed as 100, and then uh, you can go end to exit out of it. Again, make sure you save your configurations that you are doing here by typing copy run running config and startup config, which save this 
uh, uh, the configuration into your startup configuration. So if this device lose power or power cycle uh, this device, it will have all the data that you have just configured up here. I just want to highlight again that I will do all of this on a, a live lab demo and post to my YouTube channel so you'll understand exactly how this works. And uh, you can obviously don't need to use 100 here, you can use 1000 here, you can use half duplex here. So this is where all the configurations happen. Uh, for now, just remember in Cisco switches, you can go through this process of changing the duplex mode and the speed. That's what really important you need to remember in this slide. Auto MDIX. When automatic medium dependent interface crossover or auto MDIX is enabled, the switch interface automatically detects the required cable connection type, such as the straight through or crossover, and configures the connection appropriately. When connecting to switches without the auto MDIX feature, straight through cables must be used to connect devices such as servers, workstations, or routers, while crossover cables must be used to connect to other switches or uh, repeaters. With auto MDIX enabled, e uh, either type of cable can be used to connect to other devices and the interface automatically adjusts to communicate successfully. On newer Cisco switches, the MDIX auto interface configuration mode command enables this feature. When using auto MDIX on an interface, the interface speed and duplex must be set to auto so that the feature operates correctly. So if you have a Cisco switch and if you have the auto MDIX enabled, you have to make sure that the speed and the duplex is also set to auto so that the feature properly operate, otherwise it may have some conflicts and issues. And please note the auto MDIX feature is enabled by default on Catalyst 2960 and Catalyst 3560 switches, but it is not available on older Catalyst 2950 and Catalyst 3550 switches. To examine the auto MDIX settings, uh, on a specific uh, interface, use the show controllers ethernet controller command with the PHY keyword to limit the output to lines connecting, uh, sorry, uh, uh, referencing auto MDIX, use the include uh, auto MDIX uh, filter command. So I will go through those commands and features later. Uh, just remember that the auto MDIX if it is enabled, you need to make sure that the interface speed and duplex is also set to enable so that it'll operate correctly and efficiently. And also I would like to point out that most modern devices, uh, whether it's by D-Link, Cisco, or some other party, uh, whether uh, the company manufacturer, the auto MDIX is always set to uh, on by default, especially the consumer devices, auto MDIX is always, always enabled and sometimes ca cannot be disabled uh, on uh, home devices. Like if you go and buy a switch uh, for consumers or router for consumers from your nearby Best Buy store or Memory Express or somewhere, uh, those devices that you are buying, purchasing from your stores uh, for consumers are typically have all auto MDIX features turned on as well as the uh, duplex and speed set to auto because for co general purpose consumers they don't need to mess around with those features that's why it's turned on by uh, default but for enterprise devices um, such as the Cisco switches and routers uh, you have the ability to uh, con configure these things by the either by auto or turn it on and off so by rule of thumb if you are working in the field I will always use the right cable. So make sure I will always use a straight through cable uh, and crossover cables um, uh, where it is needed uh, in a certain way. Uh, so if you are using crossover cable, you are connecting switches and switches or switches and repeaters. You are using uh, straight through cables. If you are switch, uh, connecting unlike devices such as the switch and the server, for example, right? I always do that. 
but nowadays it doesn't really matter you can use um, uh, you know uh, straight through cables or crossover cables for almost anything so that's something to keep in mind so i'm going to go through uh, quickly the switch verification commands and you can post this video on this slide to you know just to look into it a little bit in depth so here are some few switch verification commands on your cisco switches so show interface and with the interface id you can check the interface the, that specific interface configuration show startup config that will display the current startup configuration and it you know it will give you everything under the startup and the show running config will give you the current running config that is not saved to the startup so you can actually check everything that you have just entered maybe before you saving it to the startup config just to make sure you don't mess up your currently running uh, operational uh, switch uh, show flash it will show the information about the flash file system show version will show you the type what type of version such as the hardware and software um, and uh, there are a few other commands down here such as uh, show ip interface uh, show ipv6 interface which i have went over already uh, here's something new that i didn't cover in this lecture or previous lecture which is show uh, mac address table or show mac address table um, so uh, they seems to be they're the same uh, kind of yeah they're the same <laughs> they actually mistype here so, so the show mac address table will show you um, the um, mac address associated uh, with your uh, ports uh, and uh, device um, you know the ports within your device and um, i believe this is supposed to redo show mac address table if you're in the configuration mode that will also uh, by uh, show the mac address table associated uh, with the different ports within in your device so again i will go through all of this on a lab demonstration so just for now just know these things do exist these commands do exist in cisco ios devices and the next few slides i will quickly go over them because uh, it's part of uh, this lecture uh, but honestly in my opinion doing labs are much better in understanding these concepts like it's better to understand this concept by doing these labs rather than just going through these lectures so but next few slides i will go over some of these commands so the show running config command can be used to verify that the switch has been correctly configured uh, from uh, sample abbreviated uh, output uh, on switch one uh, some important information is shown in here uh, they include the fast ethernet 018 interface configured with the management vlan 99 and how do we know that because by running show config we see that the interface 99 is associated uh, with uh, that uh, fast ethernet 0 slash 18 uh, and the VLAN 99 configured with an IP address of 172.17.99.11 with the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. And how do we know that? Because under in interface um, VLAN 99 is showing that information. And we also see the default gateway associated with it because it shows the default, uh, sorry, IP default gateway and the IP address associated with it. So by simply running show, uh, sorry, show running. Um, uh, config command by running that command and try uh, it shows that information just like here the show interfaces um, command is another commonly used command which display uh, status and statistics information on the network interface of the switch and in here it shows the show interface uh, fast ethernet uh, 018 so that basically we are looking at the configuration associated with the fast ethernet 018 and it shows uh, some information uh, that indicates that uh, it is operational and it also shows it is in uh, the full duplex mode with the speed of 100 megabyte per second set to it how do we know that because after we enter this command uh, it shows right here the full duplex associated with that port and it shows at 100 10 100 base uh, tx and then the, which is also under that uh, and also 
it has that uh, you know additional information that we are looking for so that's what this is showing here again I will go through them in a live lab demonstration. This is just to show you these things do exist. And the next slide, we are looking at the show interfaces command, which is useful for de detecting common media issues. So one of the most common uh, important part of this uh, output uh, is the display of the line and the data link uh, protocol status, which is shown in this example. So in here we have the show interface fast ethernet zero slash 18 and you can see that uh, it is up and the line protocol is up as well and connected and um, the first parameter uh, showing the up here is referred to the hardware layer and indicates whether the interface is receiving carrier detect signal. The second parameter which is showing the line protocol up right which is the line protocol up is referred to the data link layer and indicates whether the data link layer protocol keep alive are being received so based on the output of the show interfaces command here uh, the possible problems uh, uh, can be fixed by using you know this command's uh, output data so for example if the interface is up and the line protocol is down so that means this is up and this is down there is a problem right so there could be an encapsulation type mismatch the interface on the other end could be error uh, disable or it could be a hardware problem uh, if the line protocol and the interface are both down that means this is down and this is also showing as down a, a that could be an indicator uh, of a cable that is not attached or some other interface problem exists uh, for example in a back to back connection the other end of the connection may be administratively down that may result in even though the connection the physically connected because of the administratively down uh, both of these should may uh, show up as down if the interface is administratively down it has been manually disabled so the shutdown command has been issued in the active configuration so that means we have gone into or someone has gone into the fast ethernet 018 and the shutdown command has been issued and what you need to do is go back into this interface uh, uh configuration mode and go into uh, the fast ethernet slash 18 and then uh, issue the no shutdown command and that will uh, bring that up uh, back onto the uh, service so that's what uh, describing here again going through this slide probably not makes no sense to you so i will go through a live lab demonstration showing all of these issues and how you can troubleshoot it and fix them the next one is the show interfaces command output display counters and statistics uh, for the Ethernet 018 interface here on the right hand side. Uh, and if you go to the previous slide, uh, we did the show interfaces command here. And then in show interfaces, the, that same command can provide uh, a lot of additional uh, inter information. Uh, that may be useful as a network technician or network engineer yeah like for example it shows the errors associated with it and uh, uh, you know the collisions etc etc again i will go over these things in detail in one of my lab demonstration so some media errors are not uh, severe enough to cause the circuit to fail but cause network performance issues as I mentioned before, if you have one side half duplex, the other side is full duplex, you still may be able to communicate with each other, but it will be really bogged down. And in this table, explain some of these common errors uh, which can be detected using show interface command. So on the previous slide, we were using the show interfaces command. And in this slide, we were describing some of those errors that might encounter uh, when you enter that um, command and you see you, you know those errors showing up right so the input errors are the total number of errors that includes uh, runs uh, giants or no um, um, buffer 
uh, CRS errors, a check frame errors, you know, over on an ignore count uh, runs are packets that are um, discarded because they are smaller than the minimum packet size for the medium. Uh, for instance, uh, any Ethernet packet uh, that is less than 64 bytes is considered a runt. If you don't know what a runt is, I would recommend that you go ahead and watch my previous lectures associated with our Introduction to Network Cisco Netacad lecture series, which again, I will post a link in the description so you can click on it and then go ahead and check on that, uh, you know, watch those. This particular lecture series, I assume that you have already gone through the Introduction to Network course and you understand the concepts in there. So I'm not going to go in detail on everything. Okay. So giants uh, are packets that are uh, discarded because they exceed the uh, maximum packet size for the medium. And CRS is the, you know, check, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a checksum, right? It's like a fingerprint, as I mentioned in my previous lecture series. So if there is an issue with that fingerprint or CRS, it's going to, you know, discard that. Output errors, which is a sum of all the errors that uh, prevented the final transmission of datagrams out of the interface that is being examined. Collisions. We have covered collision multiple times. We have discussed collisions in previous lectures, which needed to be retransmitted because of there is a collision on the Ethernet. And the late collisions are collisions that occurred after 512 bytes of the frame have been transmitted. So frame has been partly transmitted and the collision occurred. That's where the late collisions are being uh, displayed. So all of these things are displayed right here with the show interface um, interfaces Ethernet command. So right here, you can see the late collisions, output errors, the frame errors, etc., uh, etc. Et In this slide, uh, they go over the same thing I just went over. So for the input errors, the sum of all errors, di datagrams that were in received on the interface being examined, and this include runs, uh, giants, CRCs, uh, no buffer, frame overruns, and ignored counts, and um, the show interface command uh, will show you the run frames, uh, giants, and CRC errors. So this slide gives you an overview of what I just covered. So if you would like to go over them again, you can pause this video and read this slide. Uh, this is the similar thing. We, I have already gone over this. This will show you the output errors, uh, which is the sum of all errors that prevented the final transmission of the datagrams out the interface that is being examined. And the reported output errors uh, from show interface command includes the collisions and late collisions. Again, I have went over these on my previous slides. Uh, you can pause this video and read this slide if you need some additional information. And for your exams and quizzes, make sure you understand both these input and output errors. Uh, and what they actually means. Like for example, if they ask what is the difference between a late collision and a collision, you should be able to describe them by separating them for that each category. Troubleshooting network access layer issues. So there is a separate course that I will go through on my YouTube channel on how you can uh, go through troubleshooting network systems. In this class, in this particular course uh, and lecture series, I will not go into depth because it is not part of uh, this Cisco Netacad program. Uh, but I, as I mentioned, I will go through a separate lecture series on this. For now, what you need to understand is mm, to troubleshoot scenarios involving no connection or a bad connection between a switch and another device, uh, follow a general process. And that general process can be summarized uh, the way that uh, the Cisco has been um, summarizing them on the right-hand side of this slide. So on your right-hand side of the screen, you have this diagram, decision-making process diagram, uh, where you have a issue with an interface. So what you're going to do is you're going to enter that show interfaces command, and then you're going to look at whether the interface is up or down. If it is up, then you're going to go through the process indicated here. 
if it is down you're going to go through the process indicated on the right hand side as opposed to left hand side and as you go through this process uh, you will complete your troubleshooting steps uh, on some companies um, they do have specific guidelines on how certain troubleshooting uh, should be done uh, on other companies that you may be working for may not have proper procedures or protocols written into documentation but as a network engineering professional you should be able to understand the proper processes and implement those processes uh, for troubleshooting your network so what you need to get out of this slide is that in every single troubleshooting scenario you should follow proper steps and document your troubleshooting processes or processes uh, so that if something to go wrong and you couldn't uh, figure out what's wrong with your network you can pass that information to the next person or the upper tiers or higher level engineers so they can look into uh, fixing the issue secure remote access telnet operation telnet uses tcp port 23 it is an older protocol that uses unsecure plain text transmission of both logging authentication which is username and password and data transmitted between the communicating devices so in other words telnet is not a secure connection it is not a secure method but it is an older protocol that we have used uh, to connect with our networking devices a threat actor therefore can monitor packets using wireshark or other network monitoring uh, software and devices uh, for example in this figure uh, the threat actor captured the username which is admin and the password ccna from a telnet session so if you look at the right hand side of your screen it's kind of a little bit hard to see but unfortunately this is the screen that was provided to us by the uh, cisco organization so on the right hand side we have a wireshark capture and it has the username uh, we, and the password captured in here so the username is showing as the admin and the password is captured as ccna so the threat actor pretty much captured what it needed what they needed to access your system so remember telnet use port 23 tcp and it is an older protocol and it is unsecured because it is using plain text to transmit not only authentication information but also data between your device and the device that you are trying to access ssh on the other hand is a secure protocol that uses tcp port 22 and it provides a secure encrypted management connection to a remote device ssh should replace the telnet for management connections uh, as um, ssh is now available more in more and more devices ssh provides security for remote connections by providing strong encryption when a device is authenticated with a username and password and also for transmitted data between the communicating devices so ssh not only provide encryption for the authentication process where you enter your username and password ssh also provide uh, the security by encryption of data transmitted between your device and the device that you are communicating with such as a cisco router or a switch the figure on the right hand side shows a wireshark capture of the ssh session the threat actor can track the session using the ip address of the administrator device however unlike telnet the ssh the username password um, and the information is encrypted uh, actually <clears throat> this screenshot is wrong so if you are looking at your uh, Cisco uh, screenshot this is actually showing the not the SSH but the the uh, this is pretty showing the telnet so that's why you can see the password here you should in, in SSH you should not be able to see the uh, password here at all again I will show you this 
in a live demonstration on EVNG, which is a simulation uh, emulation sorry emulation program. Unlike uh, Packet Tracer, which is a, a simulation program, you can use the Wireshark on EVNG and um, demonstrate this kind of um, threat act uh, activities. So I will show you on a, a separate video uh, posted to my YouTube channel how a Wireshark capture of SSH session uh, with SS um, between uh, devices. Uh, can be displayed, you know, how it is being displayed on the threat actor side. This is incorrect, actually. The, the, the image that you see on the right-hand side, this is actually showing a telnet image, unfortunately. So yeah, I will show you that on a separate video. What you need to remember here, however, is that SSH use port number 22, and it is a TCP port, and it is secure, and it use encrypted communication for both authentication as well as data transmission. Verify the switch supports SSH. So to enable SSH on a Cisco Catalyst 2960 switch, the switch must be using a version of iOS software including cryptographic uh, features and capabilities. Uh, use, you can use the, uh, the show version command on the switch to see which iOS the switch is currently running. Uh, and I, I, and I, an iOS file name that includes the combination K9, right? The K9 supports the cryptographic features and capabilities. In the example shown here, the show version command uh, shows that um, the version and the software information in here and the K9 right here, see? It, that shows that the cryptography is supported in this particular uh, Cisco iOS software version. In this particular course, for your quizzes and exams, I have not seen Cisco actually asking uh, a question on this, but however, it is possible as Cisco updates their exams and quizzes, they might give you an example with this kind of an output and they will ask you whether the, it has the ability to support the cryptography. Uh, how you know that is that K9 right here. See, you have a K9 here. I haven't seen that on my previous exams and quizzes that I went through um, on this particular course, but you might get that on your exams and quizzes. So they will give you something like this and ask you whether it, it can support cryptography or not. But for your advanced level Cisco exams, which I will cover later, uh, yes, they might actually give you a sample like this and ask you whether it supports any cryptography or not. For now, just remember that K9 uh, is a representation of cryptography and it might show up on the exam even though I haven't seen it. So how do you configure SSH on a Cisco device, right? So before configuring SSH, the switch must be minimally configured with unique host name and correct network connectivity settings. So if you are taking a Cisco switch right out of the box, you need to make sure you configure the host name um, and network connectivity settings, because if you don't do that, it will not be able to uh, set up the SSH. To set up the SSH, the very first step you need to do is to verify the SSH support. So you're gonna use the show IP SSH command to verify that the switch actually supports SSH. If the switch is not running an iOS that supports cryptographic features, this command will be uh, returning a message saying it is unrecognized. So to verify the Cisco support, you use the show IP SSH command right, which we learned in previously, uh, show version command also is a useful tool. It will actually give you some option uh, to see if the iOS is supporting cryptography with that K9. Then you can also use the uh, uh, show IP SSH command to verify for sure that, yeah, you know, the device is supporting SSH because if the show IP SSH return with a uh, unrecognized message, that means that your switch or Cisco writer is not supporting SSH. 
the next step what we're going to do uh, assuming that your device do support ssh is to configure the ip domain configure the ip domain name of the network using the ip domain name command so you're going to go ip domain name and domain name global configuration command then the next step we're going to do is to generate rsa uh, key pairs to do that uh, to generating an RSA uh, key pair automatically enables the SSH. So by ge generating the RSA key pair, you are making sure that the R RSA key pair is automatically, um, you know, making it enable. So what that means is basically by gener by creating the RSA key pair, you are actually enabling the SSH on your Cisco device. That's what you need to understand. So by enabling the RSA key pairs, you are enabling the SSH in your Cisco device. So use the crypto key generate RSA. So the, the command is crypto key generate RSA in your global configuration mode to enable SSH server on the switch and generate the RSA key pair. Note, to delete the RSA key pair, use the crypto key zeros rsa global in glo in the global configuration command after the rsa key pair is deleted the ssh server is automatically be deleted so disabled in this case so remember that as soon as you generate a rsa key pair it's going to enable the ssh server ssh uh, uh, services and when you delete the rsa key pair by using this command what's going to happen is the SSH server and the services will be automatically disabled. And the next step we're gonna do is to configure user authentication. The SSH server can authenticate users locally or using an authentication server. To use the local authentication method, create a username and password using uh, the pair of username, then you're gonna enter a username secret password and the global conf in the co global configuration mode so what we need to do is this um, command username secret and then you're going to enter the password and convey so you're going to have username uh here so it could be in here you, they put your secret and the password and then you enter the password and that will get you the username and password for the ssh uh, authentication process next thing we're going to do we need to configure the line vty and to configure VTY lines, we're going to enable the SSH protocol on the VTY lines by using the transport input SSH line configuration mode command and use the line VTY global configuration mode command and then login local line configuration command to require the local authentication for SSH connection from the local username database. And finally, we're gonna enable the SSH version two by, uh, you know, by default, the SSH uh, supports both version one and two, uh, but we can enable the SSH version two. So when supporting uh, both versions, this is shown in the show IP SSH input as supporting version two. So if it says the version, it is supporting version two, it's actually supporting both version two and version one. Enable SSH version using the IP SSH version two in the global configuration command, and that will make sure that it is supporting both version one and version two. So I know there's a lot of configuration information in this slide that is mostly hands-on. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go through a lab demonstration video, uh, going through the configuration of SSH uh, on a different, uh, uh, you know, in a different demonstration. And I will post that demonstration video to my YouTube channel so you can go ahead and watch them. And once I make that, I will post a link in the uh, description of this video. And I will also leave a card at the top right hand corner so you can go ahead and watch them. Because if you just go through these steps in your lecture notes, and you just reading them out just like I did, you're probably not gonna understand all the concepts associated with it and why we do them. So I will make sure that I will do a live demonstration and post to my YouTube channel. That way you can also go through with me and understand this concept in depth. 
But for now, just remember you need to take these steps to enable an SSH and configure it on your Cisco switches. So how do you verify if the SSH is operational on your Cisco switch or even a Cisco router? Uh, so on your PC, an SSH client such as uh, PuTTY yeah, can be used to connect to a SSH server. So if you're using PuTTY, uh, you can use that as a, um, you know, <clears throat> a software or a piece of, uh, you know, server uh, connection uh, program uh, to connect to your SSH of your Cisco device. For example, assume uh, the following configuration. So in here, we have SSH is enabled on switch one and the interface VLAN 99 SVI with IPv4 address of 172.17.99.11 on switch one is configured and the PC one with IPv4 address 172.17.99.21 is now connected to that switch. Remember, we went over uh, how to um, uh, configure the VLAN 99 for remote uh, communication. So you need to have that VLAN 99 or whatever the VLAN you pick with SVI uh, enabled with the proper IP addresses and default gateways set up in order for you to, your SSH uh, to work as well. Using a terminal emulator, initiate the SSH connection to the SVI VLAN IPv4 address of S1 from PC1. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, in this case, the PuTTY, for example, to you connect to the switch using the VLAN IP address of 172.17.99.11. When connected, the user is prompt for a username and password so in here, they're asking for a username. And then once you enter the username, they're gonna ask for the password. And using the configuration from the previous example, we're gonna use admin and CCN name, and it shows that it's been entered. After the entering the connect combi correct combination, the user is connected via SSH to the command line interface or CLI on the Catalyst 2960 switch. So that's what it's showing here. So once you enter your username and your password, it will get you to the CLI of that uh, switch. And by entering enable or EN, you can get into the, uh, the configuration part of the switch. In this case, there was a password associated with it. And by entering that password, you can get into the configuration. So that's what's shown here. And again, I will go through this demonstration on a separate video and post to my YouTube channel. And to display the version and configuration on SSH on the device that you configured as an SSH server, we can use the show IP SSH command. And in this example, when that show IP SSH command is ran and uh, the information is displayed just like here. And in, in this example, it is showing that the SSS version two is enabled. We know this because it's displaying right here as enable version two. Again, I will go through this ex these examples later on one of my demonstration videos. There is a packet tracer file called configure SSH available on your Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution. If you have access to this file, please download them and go ahead and do them. If you do not have access to this particular file, I will try to find a copy of that file and post to my YouTube channel or to my website and you can download it from there. And if I find it, I will leave a link in the description of this video so you can um, go ahead and do them. Uh, I would recommend as you go through these lectures that you do them, uh, do these packet tracer lab activities and assignments so that you have a better understanding of what we are covering in these lectures. Basic router configuration. Configure basic router settings. So we're gonna cover how you can ch change some settings on your Cisco routers and Cisco switches uh, because they are very similar to each other anyway, uh, and you will be using them in the field. So both Cisco routers and switches uses uh, similar uh, configuration uh, commands, and they support a similar uh, model operating system, uh, similar command structures, and many of the same commands are being used in both Cisco routers and switches. 
So in addition to both devices have similar initial configuration steps, um, they also have similar um, error messages as well as uh, similar uh, you know input and output messages. So that's a very unique thing about um, Cisco IOS uh, software. Uh, compared to other uh, manufacturers, Cisco was able to keep everything mostly more or less consistent. For example, the following configuration uh, task should sh always be performed. Uh, they are the name the device to distinguish from other routers and configure passwords. Uh, because reason for that is when you take a device out of a Cisco uh, brand new packaging, it all always have the default naming. For example, every router will be named as router. Every switch will be named as switch right out of the box. But if you are uh, putting these routers and switches in your network, uh, you, what you can do actually, you can use the host name command to rename uh, that router or switch. If it is a switch, you can go host name and you can go whatever the switch name. If it is a router, it's the same thing, host name and you can name whatever the router name. In this case, we are naming this router as R1, such as it's saying it's router one. And when you press enter, see the router name change from router to R1. And in the configuration mode, you can also enter a password in, in order for someone to access this uh, terminal and this configuration mode. In this case, they are setting up a password as class and uh, uh, they are uh, setting up the line console password. In here, they are setting up the line console password as Cisco. And then finally, what they are doing here is they are running the service password encryption. So I will go through them in more detail later, uh, but what you need to remember is right out of the box, the Cisco devices need to be configured uh, according to whatever your organizational plans. Otherwise, everything we're gonna have just router as your device name or switch as your device name, which could be confusing when you have hundreds of devices connected to your network. You can also configure a banner that will provide legal notification of unauthorized access. Uh, and to configure that, you can do banner MOTD and then yeah, you can either put pound sign here or the dollar sign. Uh, if you use pound sign here, make sure the end sign is also pound. If you use dollar sign here, make sure your end sign is also dollar. And in between those signs, after you enter banner MOTD, you can enter whatever the text you would like to enter. This could be multi-line text, so it doesn't have to be a single line, it can be multi-line. Uh, and in here we have, um, in this example, they entered uh, authorized access only. And then uh, once you enter that, you can save all that information by running that uh, copy running config startup config command that I have went over previously, which gonna save whatever you are uh, configuring here to the device memory. So if the device get re rebooted or restarted, uh, that information is still saved in the memory. So let's look at dual stack topology. Uh, one distinguishing feature between switches and routers is that type of interfaces supported by each. For example, layer two switches support LANs, therefore they have multiple fast ethernet or gigabit uh, ports. The dual stack topology in the following figure is used to demonstrate the configuration of router IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. So basically in this dual stack topology, we have routers and we have switches and it's showing both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and how the connections to end devices uh, works in this particular network diagram. So that's what uh, shown here. Configure router interfaces. Routers support LANs and WANs and can interconnect different types of networks. Therefore, they support many types of interfaces. For example, G2 ISRs have one or two integrated gigabit ethernet interfaces and a high-speed WAN interface card, HWIC, we also known, call them, uh, slots to accommodate other types of network interfaces, including serial, DLS, and cable interfaces. So if you take this um, 
particular router they have built in it ethernet uh, and high speed network connection ports as well as a slots available to add the modules into it to accommodate other type of interfaces again i will show you those demonstration on a packet tracer file uh, so that you can see them what it looks like uh, on the device and to be available an interface must be configured with uh, at at least one ip address has to be activated and uh, optionally uh, can, you know those um, uh, interfaces can have description so it is easy to find uh, when you try to uh, either troubleshoot or kind of reconfigure devices so um, what you need to make sure is when you are configuring those interfaces the ip address can be either ipv4 or ipv6 and if it is ipv4 the ip address must have the subnet uh, information uh, associated with it when you are configuring it and if it is ipv6 you need to make sure that you give the prefix uh, interface uh, um, you, that interface that should be associated with it and uh, how you're going to activate it is by default LAN and WAN interfaces are not activated they are under shutdown uh, but on all Cisco devices routers and switches so well, how you enable it is to run the no shutdown command which we also already covered kind of previous on our previous slides and uh, which is basically doing is uh, power uh, uh, giving uh, powering back on that switch that is currently shut down is similar to that so without that no shutdown command that switch uh, port will not be available for uh, communication and the interface must also be connected to another device such as a switch router or another device for the physical layer to be activated so after you enter the no shutdown command for the a particular port the interface may be showing as down because you haven't connected anything to that port but once you are connected something to that port uh, everything should be up and running and finally the description like i said it is an optional thing it is a short uh, description maximum 240 characters right now on cisco ios devices and it is highly recommended that you use those descriptions uh, in production environment uh, because reason for that is it benefits um, um, the next person who's going to come and check it out uh, your device or uh, the other um, um, technicians uh, and including yourself uh, when there is a troubleshooting issue and they are going through the, all the hundreds of configurations this description may come in handy in narrowing down certain uh, areas and uh, in troubleshooting in the troubleshooting process here uh, is an example of a configure Ration on a interfaces on a router one so they you uh, they use the interface command to enter into the uh, gigabit ethernet 000, 000 and they start uh, issuing the ip addresses here so you have an ip address and the subnet mask for ipv4 and they also have given ipv6 address here uh, and in here with they have the ip address uh, and the prefix in this case because it's an ipv6 they gave a meaningful description in here it says link to lan1 because maybe this connection is connecting uh, from that port to the lan1 network and then they issue the uh, no shutdown command so that the, the, this interface will be up and they repeat the similar process to the next interfaces and you can see the ip addresses change and also the description has changed as it goes through this uh, configuration so in here they have configured uh, the gigabit ethernet port 000, 000 001 and uh, serial interface 000 and gone through the same process um, of uh, giving uh, you know in configuring those uh, information ipv4 loopback interfaces another common configuration of cisco ios router is enabling a loopback interface remember i cover the loopback interfaces on my previous lecture series but just to refresh your mind the loopback interface is a logical interface that is internal to the router it is not assigned to a physical port and can never be connected to any other device it is considered a software interface that is automatically placed in an up state as long as the router is functioning 
The loopback interface is useful in testing and managing Cisco iOS device because it ensures that at least one interface will always be available. For example, it can be used for testing purposes such as testing internal routing processes by eliminating network behind the router. So, sorry, by emulating network behind the router. So this is a very uh, important concept. So if somebody asks, or if your exam shows, uh, or one of the exam questions, they ask you like, what is the purpose of a loopback interface? Well, the loopback interface is basically emulating networks behind a router, and it al allows you to have an always on network interface for testing purposes. So loopback interfaces are also commonly used in lab environments to create additional interfaces. So that is another reason why we as students uh, and network engineering testers um, uh, may use loopback interfaces. For example, you can create multiple loopback interfaces on a router to simulate more networks for configuration practice and testing purposes. IPv4 addresses, sorry, IPv4 address for each loopback interface must be unique and unused by other interfaces. So if you're using these loopback interfaces, you need to make sure the IP address you are assigning to those IPv4 loopback interfaces are unique and not being used by anybody else, any other interfaces. In this curriculum, in this lecture series, we use a loopback interface to simulate a link to the internet. So we basically don't have access to the internet on Cisco Packet Tracer. So what we're gonna do actually, we're gonna use the loopback interface to simulate a internet connection. Again, I will go through them on a real lab uh, simulation that I will post to my YouTube channel later. But just remember how you enable and assign you loopback interfaces is by going interface loopback and then you're gonna give a number associated with that. And then you're gonna go IP address and then give the IP address associated with that loopback interface and the subnet mask. It is important that this IP address is not used by any other interfaces and it is unique to that loopback interface uh, that way that you know there are no conflict when you are configuring this. If you like to know a little bit more about loopback, again, there are videos that I posted previously, you can go ahead and watch them. If you have access to Cisco NetAcad, there is a packet trace activity called configure router interfaces. Please go ahead and do them. If you do not have access to this packet tracer file through either Cisco NetAcad or through your academic institution, I will try to find a copy of that file and post it to my website. And if I find it, I'll leave a link in the description of this video. Verify directly connected networks. Interface verification commands. Uh, there are several show commands that can be used to verify the operation and configuration of an interface. And um, there are few useful commands that you should know uh, in this class. They are IP, sorry, show IP interface brief, show uh, IPv6 interface uh, brief. Uh, they display a summary of for all interfaces, including IPv4, IPv6 addresses of the interface, and current operational status. Then uh, the show running config interface uh, with the interface ID uh, at the front right here. So you type show IP conf running config interface and then you enter the ID here. Uh, this display the commands apply to specific interface and show IP route and show IP uh, v6 route uh, displays the um, contents of the IPv4 and IPv6 route ta uh, routing table stored in the RAM. Uh, and you should also remember in Cisco iOS 15, active interfaces should appear in the routing table with two related entries identified by the code C, which stand for connected, or L, which stand for L. In previous iOS versions, only a single entry with the code C will appear, so that's uh, one small note that you should be aware of. So in our Cisco iOS 15, active in interfaces should appear in the routing table with two related entries identified by code C, uh, but the previous one, uh, I mean code C, which means connected or L with the local, but the previous ones we only have C. So just something you should remember. Again, I don't think it will show up on your exam or quiz specific to that question, but you should, 
um, for lab exam for this class, uh, you should be able to um, understand what does the show IP interface brief, uh, show running config, and show IP route uh, will do. The output of the show IP interface brief and show IP v6 interface brief ca commands can be used to quickly uh, get the information on the status of all interfaces on the router and you can verify that the interfaces are active and operational as indicated by the status or up and protocol up as shown in this example a different uh, output would indicate a problem either uh, with the configuration uh, or you know uh, something with the, the physical connection so in here we have these uh, show IP interface brief and show IP v6 interface brief command run and all of them are showing us up on both uh, status and protocol and remember these can be administratively down and you know if you have uh, your port turned on but no device connected on the other end uh, you know the protocol may showing up as down or status may be showing up as down for example you know like there are certain combinations will give you hints of what's wrong with your network by running this command so that's what you need to understand verify ipv6 link local and multicast addresses uh, so uh, the output of the show IPv6 interface brief on the other hand uh, command display uh, two configured IPv6 uh, I, um, addresses per interface. Uh, one address is the IPv6 global unicast address that was manually entered and the other address uh, which begins with the FE80 which we have covered in my previous lectures uh, from the introduction to networks lecture series. <coughs> is the link local unicast address for the interface. So remember that FE80, we learned in our previous lectures, is a you know indicator of the link local unicast address for the interface. A link local address is automatically added to an interface whenever a global unicast address is assigned. An IPv6 network interface is required to have a link local address, but not necessarily a global unicast address. You should be familiar with this concept by now because these concepts are already covered in the introduction to networks lecture series, which you should have been completed before you started this new lecture series, right? So you should be here, you should remember these from your previous lectures. The show IPv6 interface gigabit ethernet 00, 00 command displays the interface status and all of the IPv6 addresses belonging to the interface. Along with the link local address and global unicast address, the output ad includes the multicast addresses assigned to the interface beginning with the prefix FF02 as shown in this example. So in here, we have the information that get displayed after you type the show IPv6 interface and whatever the port that you're trying to look at. In this case, this is the gigabit 000. And you see that the IPv6 is, is enabled and we have a link local address starting with that FE80. See that FE80 and the link local address. And you also see the global unicast address the uh, and as well as the prefixes associated um, uh, you know, the uh, interfaces, sorry, uh, the output include the multicast addresses uh, associated to that interface with the prefix FF02 and these ones. So this is this is an example. This is actually the link local address, uh, FE02 um, colon colon uh, one. So that is shown here uh, in this example. Again, I will go through them on a live demonstration uh, on one of my live lab videos. The output of the show running config interface command displays the current commands applied to the specified interface. And they are shown right here in the, on the bottom. And the following two commands are used to gather more detailed uh, interface information show interfaces and show IP interface 
uh, and show IPv6 interface. So the show IP interfaces display the interface information and packet flow count for all interfaces on the device. So if you have been running your lab environment for a while, you can go show IP, uh, sorry, show interfaces to display the packet flow count uh, during that uh, particular lab. And the show IP interface and show IPv6 interface display the IPv4 and IPv6 related information uh, for all interfaces on the router. So in here, we have show IP running config interface gigabit 000. And again, here is showing some information associated uh, with those IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. Again, I will go through them on a lab so you'll understand this much better than just going through these slides. Verify routes. The output of the show IP route and show IPv6 route commands uh, will provide you with three directly connected network entries and three host uh, routes interfaces entries shown on the right hand side. So in here, in this example, we have three uh, uh, local host route interface entries um, and uh, three directly connected networks uh, also shown here. So in here we have the show IP route and that information is shown here and show IPv6 route, that information shown down here. The local host route has an administrative interface, sorry, administrative distance of zero. It also has slash 32 subnet mask or sub, slash 32 mask for IPv4 and slash 128 mask for IPv6. The local host route is for IP routes on the router that owns the IP address. So remember that the local host route is the is for the routes on the router that owns the IP address. It is used to allow the router to process packets distinct to that particular IP. So as you go through this course and go through your lab material, you'll get more and more familiar with uh, what these displays mean. Uh, what you need to understand in this example, uh, it has the, uh, the this information displayed and it shows a slash 32 IPv4 and a slash 128 uh, for IPv6. Um, so, um, sorry, slash um, 32 to, for IPv4 and slash 28 for, uh, 128 for IPv6. And you can actually see that in here, so right here, it says slash 128 right here and slash 32 right here. So that's what you're seeing here. Again, I will go through this in much more detail and much more hands-on in my lab uh, demonstration video. But for now, just remember these two commands, IP show IP route and show IPv6 route and what it will display on your Cisco routers and also switches. Switches mean, I mean like the layer three switches, for example, may have the similar configuration. So I will go through them later as well. So, yeah. So if you look at this the output from the show IP route or show IPv6 route, you see these uh, letters C's and L's right here. So a C next to a route within the routing table indicates that this is a directly connected network. When the router interface is configured with a global unicast address and it is in the up up state, the IPv6 prefix and the prefix length are added to the IPv6 routing table as connected routes. So remember that when a router interface is configured with a global unicast address and the state is both up. So basically the state is uh, up on both uh, protocols uh, and the IPv6 prefix and the prefix length are added to the IPv6 routing table as connected routes. So you can actually see that right here as a C showing here and they are actually directly connected. Actually, they tell you it's directly connected here as well. So IPv6 global unicast address applied to the interface is also installed in the routing table as a local route. The local route has slash 128 slash 128 prefix. You can see that here 
right here it's 128 and local routes are used by the routing table to efficiently process packets with the interface address of the router as uh, the destination so that's what the local routes are being used again i know it's a lot of information and it's kind of confusing looking at this i will go in in detail and much in depth of every single one of these um, lines and what it's displaying here with these commands in my lab demonstration video filter show command output commands that generate multiple screens of output are by default pause after 24 lines so if you actually enter a command that has a lot of information it will display about 24 lines and then it's, it will be paused at the end of the post output you will see this which is basically dash dash more dash dash which is basically a text message uh, for the user pressing enter display the next line and pressing space bar display the next set of lines so if you press enter after you see this more it will just show the next line but if you uh, press the space bar it will show the next page pretty much so the terminal length a command to specify the number of lines to be displayed a value of zero prevents the router from pausing between screens of output so if you use the terminal length command and you enter the value of zero and it prevents the router from pausing between those screens and it will just show the entire output another very useful feature that improves the user experience in cli or command line is the filtering of show output filtering commands can be used to display specific sections of output to enable the filtering commands enter the pipe this is this dash not the dash this line so remember this is again going back to the fact that the cisco is based on linux and unix architecture if you have familiar with using linux and unix servers and machines this is the pipe command we use there as well and also you actually see this pipe command in um, windows uh, powershell as well so you, you use the same things pipe command the pipe character after a show command and then enter a filtering parameter in the cisco ios uh, to filter an expression so there are four filtering parameters that can be configured after that pipe um, um, character that would include uh, section include exclude and begin so section shows the entire section that starts with the filtering expression include uh, includes all output lines that match the filtering expression exclude includes all output lines that match the filtering expression that should be excluded you know and then the began shows all uh, the output lines from a certain point starting with the line that matches the filtering expression so those are the key features of that pipe command and how you can use uh, to filter your output again i will show you an extensive video the, of going through these commands on my lab demonstration uh, video that i will be posted later onto my youtube channel command history feature so the command history feature is useful because it temporarily uh, stores the list of executed commands uh, that can be recalled and to recall commands in uh, history buffer you can press uh, ctrl uh, with uh, p key on your keyboard or you can simply use the arrow keys up and down to go back and forth between previous commands the command output begins with the most recent command which means if you press the up arrow on your keyboard it will show you the pre most pre recent previous command that you entered repeat the key sequence to recall a success successively all the commands so if you keep pressing up and up and up button it will show the previous commands that you have entered to return to more recent commands in the history buffer you can also uh, go ctrl with the uh, n key uh, or the arrow down key which is the opposite of the ctrl p or the arrow up key and again repeating those buttons uh, for example arrow down key will give you the previous uh, commands um, you know the older commands uh, in the buffer uh, by default command history is enabled and the system captures at least 
10 command lines in its history buffer. Use the show history privilege in the privilege executive command to display the content of that buffer. Uh, it is also practical to increase the number of command lines that the history buffer records uh, during the current terminal session. Uh, so you, to do that, uh, what you can do is you can use the terminal history size command uh, in the user executive command to increase or decrease the size of that buffer. Again, I will show you how to go through those uh, processes on my live lab demonstration. Uh, and some advantages as well as disadvantages associated with them. For now, just remember there is a feature to increase the buffer size and how to access that buffer. If you have access to your Cisco NetAcad or you have access to files from Cisco NetAcad through your academic institution, please download the verified directly connected networks packet tracer assignment and go ahead and do them. If you do not have access to this particular file, I'll try to find a copy of them, post to my YouTube channel or to my website, and I will try to go through them and show you a live demonstration and post that video as well. And that brings us to the end of this lecture. And now I will go through quickly what we have learned. And before that, if you have access to uh, Cisco NetAcad, again, please download this file called the Implement a Small Network. That will go over everything we covered in this lecture. And by doing these packet tracer files, you will get to learn everything we covered in the hands-on environment. If you do not have access to this file, I will try to find a copy and post to my website. There's also another Cisco lab, uh, which is a packet tracer file called a configure basic router settings. If you do have access to Cisco NetAcad, either through the Cisco NetAcad site or through your academic institution, go ahead, download them and do it again. And if you don't have it, I will make sure uh, that I can get hold of one of these documents, uh, these documents, and I will post it to my YouTube channel and my website. So finally, Let's have a quick summary of everything we covered in the first lecture for this lecture series. We learn after a Cisco switch is powered on, it goes through five step boot sequence. A boot environment variable is set using the boot system global configuration mode command. We also learn the use uh, of the switch LEDs uh, and how we can use that to monitor switch activities and performance. And remember what those LED means for your exams and quizzes. We also learn the bootloader provides access to the switch if the operating system cannot be used because of missing or damaged files. So if you have a Cisco device and Cisco iOS file is corrupted, uh, the bootloader will provide uh, your, uh, in, in the ability for the system administrator or you to access the device and still uh, load a new iOS or file, for example. We learn about uh, how to prepare a switch for remote management access. Uh, and we learn that the switch must be configured with an IP address and a subnet mask, because if the switch doesn't have those information for the remote uh, management interface, you won't be able to access the um, switch remotely. We learn about how you can manage the switch from a remote network. And uh, to do that, you also need to give the switch a default gateway in addition to the IP address and the subnet mask. We learn about the full duplex communication increase effective uh, bandwidth by allowing both ends of the connection to transmit and uh, receive that data uh, simultaneously. We learn about switch port can be uh, manually configured with specific duplex settings and speed settings. Uh, the use of auto configuration when uh, it is in place, the speed and duplex settings uh, of the device connecting to the port are uh, automatically, automatically configured and it is very useful in a situation where you have devices that connect into your network that 
uh, you um, have no control over or you don't know what they're connecting. Like for example, if you have a corporate or office environment, you have a Cisco switch or a router where your users are bringing their laptop computers from home and connecting to the network. The auto configuration feature is a very useful feature uh, that will do the, uh, the speed and duplex settings automatically. And we also mentioned that having uh, one side of the network full duplex, the other side of the network half duplex will be inefficient. And that is one of the most common issues um, uh, with network communication uh, issues, uh, speed issues uh, in corporate and business environment. So if you are a network engineer or network technicians, uh, troubleshooting network speeds and issues, the first thing I would do is to check the duplex settings. We learn when auto MDIX is enabled, the interface automatically detects the required cable connection type, whether it's a straight through or crossover, and configures the connection appropriately. So unlike in the old days where you had to make sure the cable is the right cable for the right device, that you are using straight through cable for the right devices and crossover cable for the right devices. With modern day systems, as long as auto MDIX is enabled, you can use any cable and it will automatically uh, figure out what needed to be done. And most newer Cisco switches and most uh, consumer devices, uh, the auto MDIX is enabled by default. And if you go to the store and buy a consumer, non-enterprise consumer switch or a router, I can almost guarantee you all of the ports are uh, uh, configured with auto negotiation as well as auto MDIX um, enabled by default. There are several show commands uh, we learn uh, that can be used to verify switch configurations. Um, I'm not going to go over them right now, but you know, if you can go back in this video and check it out uh, and remember what they are and what they are used for, uh, for your exams and quizzes. We learn about Telnet, which is an insecure older uh, uh, protocol uh, that use uh, plain text transmission, not only for authentication, but also for data transmission and it use TCP port 23. With modern uh, switches uh, and devices within your network, we use SSH, uh, which is using port uh, 22 TCP and provide much more secure uh, remote connections uh, by encrypting uh, not only authentication, authentication data such as username and password, but also the transmitting data that communicating between devices. So SSH is much more secure and whenever it is possible that you can use SSH over Telnet, always use the SSH over Telnet because do not use the Telnet when SSH is available. Uh, the only time you should be using Telnet is if there is a problem with your SSH system uh, or uh, you do not have the ability to enable SSH in your older uh, networking devices. An iOS file name that includes a combination of K9 support cryptographic features and capabilities. So on an exam or quiz, if they give you a bunch of iOS file names and ask which one supports, supports the cryptographic features, you should be able to figure that out by looking at that K9 uh, value. And to configure SSH, you must verify that the switch supports it. So if the switch or the router doesn't have that K9, you know, cryptographic uh, capability, uh, you know, indicator on the file name, uh, it probably doesn't have the SSH support. And to configure uh, the domain and generate uh, RSA key pairs, configure use authentication, configure the uh, y, uh, y, uh, VTY lines, and you need to also enable the SSH version too. So those are the things we went over. So with SSH uh, section of this lecture, we cover you know RSA key pairs, authentication, how do you create a use authentication, line VTY uh, configurations, and how you can enable the SSH version choose. And we also learned to verify that the SSH is operational. We can use the show IP SSH command to display the version and the configuration data for the SSH on the device. We also learned uh, the following the initial configuration task should always be performed things like the naming, name the device to the distinguish it from the other routers. Like for example, when you take a 
router or a switch uh, right out of the Cisco box. It will have router as the default name, switch as the default name for the you know host name, and you need to use the host name and then change the host name using that command so that it is distinguishable on your network. For example, if you have a router, uh, this is your third router, you can go host name R3. That means that the host name gonna change from just router to R3, right? And you need to remember to configure your password for line VTY as well as a console line uh, uh, password so that, that uh, you know, the, the device is properly secured. We also learn about the banner, uh, you know, for legal notices. Uh, how to do MOTD banner. And uh, we also uh, learn that it is important that you change all of this configuration because right out of the box, all Cisco devices have those, uh, the default value is the same, right? So all of the routers gonna have router, all of the switches gonna have switches. So that's why you need to change all of this information. Another thing we uh, learn is that uh, there are some distinguishing features between switches and routers. And one of them is the type of interfaces supported by the each device. So uh, routers uh, support uh, more interfaces than the switches, the types of uh, interfaces. And the routers support LANs, WANs, and can interconnect uh, the different types of networks. And therefore, they support many types of interfaces compared to the Cisco switches. The IPv4 loopback interface is a logical interface. We learn about that. Uh, and that is uh, internal to the router, and it is not assigned to a physical port and can never be connected to any other device. And we also learned that the IPv4 loopback is typically always on, and it is used for testing purposes. And in this particular lecture series uh, in Cisco, um, Cisco, uh, packet tracer, we will be using those IPv4 loopback interfaces as our connection to the internet is simulating or emulating the internet. Um, the proper word would be simulating because I will explain about the difference between simulation and emulation in labs. So uh, remember that. So IPv4 uh, loopback is used uh, for simulation of the internet in this particular lecture series. The use of following commands uh, to quickly identify the status of interfaces. We learn about that. We learn about the IP, show IP interface brief, show IPv6 interface brief. We learn about show running config. Um, and we also uh, learn about the show IP route and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go through them again here, but remember what these commands mean and how they can be used in your Cisco labs, uh, especially for the lab exams. Uh, we learn about the filter show command uh, output using the pipe, which is the same pipe that we use on uh, uh, Linux and Unix devices. And that can filter expressions uh, by using section uh, include, exclude, and begin, and know what they are and how to use them. Again, I will show you a live demonstration on how we can do that. And uh, by default, the command history is enabled on all Cisco devices and the system capture the last 10 command lines uh, that you have entered to the device, but you have the ability to increase or uh, that uh, you know number of uh, command lines that been um, saved in the history buffer. The show history uh, in the privilege executive command uh, can be used to display those buffer content uh, that been uh, saved as you uh, go through the configuration on Cisco routers and switches. So that is the end of this lecture. Uh, if you like this video, please thumbs up this video and subscribe to my channel because in the next few uh, weeks, I will be posting the next few lectures associated with this lecture series. If you have any questions or concerns regarding this particular lecture, please feel free to contact me and I will get back to you as soon as possible. And I will make sure that I will up, I will upload those uh, labs that I promise that I will upload in the next few weeks as well. Until next time, good luck with your exams and have a nice day.